Well, I got to meet some of you. I still have to meet some more of you. And I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today for this event. I mean, how many of you are from out of state? Just raise your hand. Awesome. I mean, this is, this is great. So good to see all your faces. And, you know, the Lord has something wonderful in store for us. I think it's a privilege and a blessing any time that we can have Jacob Prash or, or anybody from Moriel, for that matter. But uh, let's give the Lord a hand for that ministry. I, I can honestly say uh, there's a number of men in the body of Christ that over the years have impacted me massively in terms of insights into the Scripture and studying to show themselves approved and just teaching that is heavy duty. Amen? Yeah. Boldness in the face of the famine for the Word of God that we're experiencing today. Would you, would you agree that that's where we're at? So any time that we have the freedom to proclaim the truth of the Scriptures, like we're going to hear today, I'm just so happy to be able to say that I was here and to be able to participate in this, and so good to have all of you with us. So we're going to pray for our brother and let him get going. I will get you some light here in just one second, okay? But uh, let me... Uh, let me pray for him, and we're going to let him loose. Amen. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for this beautiful day that you made. Lord, as we look at the creation, even as we drive out here, it shows your handiwork. It declares your craftsmanship. It declares your power over all things. Even as we deal with the issues of our bodies as we grow older and uh, of the other conditions of this planet, Father God, we just thank you that you are strong and powerful and in control of these things. Lord, we don't need to fret or worry in the face of even the conditions that surround us in our society and in our world and even here in our country. As we watch it going a certain direction, it is what you warned us would happen in the last days. But Father, we can have great joy and great shalom in our hearts because we know Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And Lord, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for David Lister, and uh, there are other companions that have traveled here today representing Moriel Ministries, and I just pray right now for Jacob Prash that you will give him the words that he needs to share with us. Lord, may we have ears to hear what your word says to us today, and again, we just thank you for the blessing that it is to have our brother here. I pray for him physically today. I pray that you will just give him strength and endurance to give us two great sessions and two more tomorrow, as you will. Father, bless everyone who came here today, and we do pray for safety uh, as we travel various places. But once again, may you be glorified here today as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Join me in welcoming Jacob Prash. Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. I'm just trying to find out if we're being live streamed yet. So. Not yet. No. And don't wait. Don't wait. We got to get this. The noise from the back is going to be picked up on the mic, so they have to keep it quiet in there. Okay. okay. <laughs> Tell me when we're ready to live stream. Be quiet. Be quiet while you're trying oh, okay. To okay. I'm kidding. Everybody's busy. We're gonna we're gonna record the audio. We'll get the video in as soon as we can. And then Okay, that would be one to do it. Well, blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us and for the people who are watching on live stream and so forth and who will be watching on YouTube and on other avenues. Be that as it may, we're going to have several sessions today and tomorrow. The main teachings will be tomorrow. The life is in the blood and also a devotional, but the life is in the blood will be the big teaching tomorrow. Today we're going to have two teachings. The first teaching I was assigned by the Fellowship Bible Chapel is something that we visited multiple times um, from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The other will be the death of the cults. After the break, we'll be looking at the death of the cults, what is happening in the world of the cults, why they are declining, and what it means for us. So we'll be looking at the death of the cults, but in the first session, I hate reinventing the wheel. Everyone knows what I believe in Tresil. I believe that the pre-wrath is the closest to the biblical position. 
even though they have the identity of the restrainer wrong, they're basically right in the rest of what they say, my pre-trib friends and brethren. Um, everybody knows why I believe those things. Everybody knows why the believers here in Fellowship Bible Chapel teach these things. So I don't want to just, again, sound like a broken record um, or preach to the choir or try to convince the already convinced. What I'd like to do is highlight 2 Thessalonians from different aspects and present it in a way differently, but also highlight different aspects than we've done in the past. One of the things I would like to do today after the introduction is eight things pre-tribulationists do not want to discuss. Eight things that pre-tribulationists wish to avoid discussion of, that they can't really deal with effectively or even deal with at all. Eight things that pre-tribulationists can't cope with, really, effectively. They prefer to avoid these subjects. Now understand, I'm not attacking all pre-tribulationists. I have brothers in the Lord who are my friends who are pre-tribulationists. They are not all the same. There is a newfangled, renegade pre-tribulationism that departs from the traditional one. These people are propagating, frankly, the absurd notion, unsupportable from Greek, unsupportable from, from context, that the apostasy, the falling away in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the rapture itself, that it's a spatial departure. Now understand traditional pre-tribulationists, such as Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who successfully debated Hank Hanegraaff, and Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, the Messianic scholar, they don't accept this. They don't believe this. This is a new kind of pre-trib. Well, why have they done this? In their desperation to save a sinking ship, they know they have a problem coping with the plain, literal, exegetical meaning of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says that the Antichrist will have to be recognized before the Episunagage, our gathering together to be with the Lord. Finally, what I'd like to do in this first session is look at the question, and this is what we want to do now, how did the early church view the sequence of events surrounding the rapture? How did the early church understand these scriptures? I pointed out a number of times the most theologically significant figure of the second century, of the early patristic era, of the anti-Nicene church, of the people who came immediately after the apostles as leaders, was Irenaeus. Irenaeus may have seen the apostle John, but he got his doctrine directly from Polycarp. Polycarp got his doctrine from John, Irenaeus got his doctrine from Polycarp. Irenaeus is the last historical link we have with what the apostles taught. <coughs> John being the last of the apostles. God supernaturally kept John alive to an extremely old age. Even by modern standards, he'd be quite old. There wouldn't be many people reaching nearly 100 years of age even now. But in that era, when the average person died between 55 and 60, perhaps, it, was almost, it would have been phenomenal. It was plainly a divine hand that kept him alive to write the book of Revelation. And Irenaeus tells us that John did author Revelation during the uh, persecution of the Emperor Domitian at the end of the first century. So Irenaeus is really important. Irenaeus got his doctrine from John via Polycarp, tells us what John believed and what the disciples of John said John believed. Uh, there are other sources, but he's the main one. And also, he wrote in both Greek and Latin. He wrote for both the eastern half of the Roman Empire and Greek, but he went to Lyon and France, to the Latin-speaking half. So he was universal in his impact. He was somebody God raised up at that time. Now, this time, this post-apostolic era, when Irenaeus told us what John believed and taught about the rapture, was a time very much like our own. Very much like our own. It was a time 
when scriptural orthodoxy, biblical Christianity, if you will, the apostolic doctrine, the evangelical gospel in modern terms, was just another strain. There were so many cults and so many schismatic groups with so many diverse theologies, especially in the area of Christology, believing different things about Jesus. There were problems with Marcionites. There were problems with modelists. There were problems with adoptionists. And there were problems with an ever-growing Gnosticism. People who were mystics and who misinterpreted the scripture mystically instead of exegetically. That's not to ignore things like typology or other exegetical methods used by the apostles from, that came from the Jewish world of the first century, such as the use of Midrash as a hermeneutic. That, those things are valid. But when you had people reading into the text things not there and spiritualizing it out of context, there were so many factions and fragments with crazy beliefs, much of it wrong belief about the Lord Jesus himself, that what we would consider or what would be considered the scriptural gospel, the scriptural church, the scriptural body of dogma from the apostles, it was just another string of a hundred strings hanging from the ceiling. It was just another string. That's how bad things became and how confused it became. So in the Greco-Roman world, in the pagan world and beyond, when you said Christianity, it would have been so fragmented and so all over the place that people just tended to lump it all together. They didn't make these kinds of distinctions. Now today that's very true. If you were to say Christian in the Muslim world, they don't care Catholic or Protestant. You know? <laughs> It doesn't matter, or in Japan, they don't care Catholic or Protestant. They just don't make those distinctions. Um, evangelical, it doesn't matter. They just lump it all together. Well, it was very much like that at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. When the apostles were alive, when the apostles were around, false doctrines and false gospels were refuted by the authority of the apostles. The apostles write about this. Paul writes about this. There were actually people circulating forged epistles saying that they were writing as Paul or as one of the apostles. They were actually forging letters in the names of the apostles. There was so much confusion, so much diversity, so much heresy. Irenaeus came and he wrote something against all heresies, against all heresies, and it was almost a kind of a tome. He had what the apostles taught, the doctrine that he got from John via Polycarp, and he compared these other heresies to it. Much of it to do with Christology, most of it to do with other things, but a fair amount of it to do with what we would call eschatology, or the study of the last days, the end of the age. Well, today it's very much the same. You've got a diverse array of beliefs about Jesus or about the triunity of the Godhead today, even among people professing to be evangelical. Um, you've got people who are pure Gnostics and mystics. If you were to look at the Bethel thing in Redding, California with Bill Johnson, where the Holy Spirit is a blue genie, and this, this, this is, these people are pure mystics. They're hermeneutic is purely Gnostic. If you look at the way the people in the laughing and drunken revivals, counterfeit revivals, were mishandling scripture, it was perforated with Gnostic thinking instead of biblical exegesis. Or at best, it was exegesis. They were reading things into the scripture it didn't say. Another problem, and one we've often highlighted, is obviously the Christology. Jesus repeatedly warned about false Christ in the last days. Again, you have two people named Robert Jones in the 
Columbus Telephone Directory, does that mean they're the same Robert Jones because they have the same name? Okay. Well, this was Israel's problem with Baal worship. Yahweh was to be Israel's Baal, the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner, but the Canaanites also had a Baal. You've got a Baal, we've got a Baal, they're the same Baal. This became a real problem in the early church once again. Which Jesus? Which Jesus? You had Docetus who said that Jesus only appeared to be physically human. When he walked on the sand, there was no footprints. Okay, his body was purely, purely spiritual. You had Arians. Jehovah's Witnesses are like Arians. They believed that Jesus was the angelic being. That's all. They believed he was an angel, as the Jehovah's Witnesses do with Michael. You had Neo-Galatians, much the same as the modern Seventh-day Adventists, or the extremists of the, of the modern Messianic movement, people trying to live under two covenants. You had all kinds of Gnostics and mystics, all kinds. It was a very, very confused time and a confused environment. <coughs> but today it's the same. Which Jesus? You've heard me point out, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I testify to you, I have a burning in my bosom, and the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Well, according to the Book of Mormon, their Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. The scriptural Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. The Mormons have a different Jesus. In Islam, you've got people now trying to push Chrislam and make Christianity somehow compatible with Islam. Uh, and people who say they're born again attempting to do this. Well, in Islam, Isa, believers in Arabic call him Yeshua HaMasiyah. Non-believing Arabs call him Isa. He's a prophet, not the son of God. Allah has no son. He's not begotten, neither does he beget. And he's a prophet who's inferior to Muhammad. Islam has a different Jesus. Muslims will tell you, the Koran speaks more about Jesus than it does Muhammad. That's true. The Koran speaks more about Jesus than it does Muhammad, but it's a different Jesus. <laughs> it's a different Jesus. Here in the American Midwest, because going back to the history of the French colonialists in the 18th century and earlier, there's still a strong Roman Catholic influence. Still to this day, probably a number of you are former Roman Catholics. Well, Jesus said, if anyone tells you I've returned other than the way I left, don't believe it. I'm coming back the way I left. If they say he's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't believe it. Every time there's a mass, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Jesus returns physically under the appearances of transubstantiated bread and wine, the blessed sacrament. They literally worship and pray to the bread and wine as the physical incarnation of Christ. It is another Jesus. The Eucharistic Christ of the Roman Church is a different Jesus. The Mormons have a different Jesus. The Muslims have a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a different Jesus. But they're all named Jesus so we can have unity. <laughs> you understand? This is not a new problem or a new phenomena. This kind of thing was happening at the end of the apostolic age. Irenaeus is raised up, getting his doctrine, he had Yohanan theology via Polycarp, and he becomes the primary bulwark against all these errors, against all these heresies. He writes against Celsius and all these other people. He writes about against a number of people, but he told the truth. Now, this was the first discernment ministry. <laughs> However, his approach was quite good. He didn't simply say what was wrong, he began by saying what was right. 
Well, today we have a problem. You have people calling themselves discernment ministries, and the only way to know what they're for is to identify what they're against. <laughs> you don't begin with the error. You begin with the truth. Once you begin with the truth, the error becomes easier to identify and define and understand and explain. The premise for discernment must be proactive, not reactive. First, proact. The way Paul explains the gospel in Romans before he reacts to the false gospel or the corruption of it in Galatians. We have things to learn from the people who got their doctrine from the apostles, and there were other ones other than Irenaeus, but he's the primary one we'll look at today, albeit not the only one. Now, I know many of you know most of these things from our books and our recordings, but we're live streaming, so I have to say it for the sake of those who don't. My apologies to those who know it, which many of you obviously already more or less do. Some of you more, some less, but most of you, or a lot of you, are familiar with these things, broadly speaking. So, before we look at 2 Thessalonians, it's important to realize the obvious fact that it was the second letter that the Holy Spirit inspired to be written to the church in Thessalonica. To understand its content in its context, we have to first go to 1 Thessalonians, not 2. Never begin to understand 2 Thessalonians unless you read 1 Thessalonians. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we're of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, etc. He talks about the armor in a way that's related to Isaiah 59 and to Ephesians 6. Well, let's understand this then. This concept of the night and the day, the sons of darkness and the sons of light, was well known within both Jewish and Greek culture and religious philosophy at the time. It was known in Persia among the Zoroastrians. The followers of Zarathustra had this concept. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes built their community around this idea of a conflict between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. <laughs> Many people were claiming to be sons of light who were not. <laughs> that was part of the problem. Many people were claiming to be sons of light who were not, even though they all acknowledged that there was a conflict between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. Addressing this, he talks about, while well, they are saying peace and safety, then the end will come. We've pointed out in my book, Shadows of the Beast and other places, that the Antichrist will attempt to counterfeit the return of Jesus. Jesus comes on the white horse in Revelation 19. The Antichrist comes on a white horse in Revelation chapter 6. Jesus establishes the millennial kingdom, the Antichrist attempts to initially counterfeit it in order to deceive people and particularly to deceive Israel. And it's going to work up to a point. There will be a false sense of respite. The second thing we have to understand is the obstetric illustration, which is cardinal to understanding the return of Jesus. 
We see it repeatedly in the book of Jeremiah. We see it certainly climaxing in Revelation chapter 12. What happens with maternal contractions? They become more frequent and intense before the baby comes. They intermittently ease up, but it is a temporary respite. They become more frequent and more intense until the baby comes. You can have a period of respite in maternal labor, and it can go on for a while, but it comes back with a double ferocity. The last days will be like that for the church and ultimately for Israel. There may be interim periods of respite, but people will be deceived to thinking at one point things are actually getting better. People will be deceived into thinking things are actually getting better. The ones who will not are the faithful church. <laughs> now we are cautioned about sobrizo, sobriety. I recall a number of years ago, there was a false teacher from South Africa. He's still active. I'm um, only stating facts. Rodney Howard Brown was teaching people to be quote unquote drunk in the spirit. And he wrote a song, composed a song called Drinking at Joel's Place, supposedly from the book of Joel. Now when you read Joel chapter one, and Joel is speaking of the end of the age, Joel says, awake ye drunkards. The actual message of Joel is not to get drunk but to sober up. Rodney Howard Brown was teaching the opposite. And you saw the people going into Toronto and Pensacola and places like this. They were doing the very thing that the scripture says not to do. There will be a spiritual inebriation. When somebody is inebriated, they're not alert. They're not aware. They're not totally functional. Alcohol impairs people's ability to drive if you drink too much. Alcohol impairs all kinds of things. Well, it certainly impairs awareness. You don't want someone in a dangerous situation to be intoxicated on alcohol. Likewise, there is spiritual inebriation. People get drunk with spirits, as it were. They become demonically deceived. We have to understand the relationship between the apostasy and inebriation. People become deluded. If someone drinks too much alcohol, they begin to feel good. But it's an artificial feeling good. In the morning, they'll have a hangover. They can think their problems are disappearing as they become more inebriated. They think their problems are disappearing. Relax, you know, have a couple of drinks. You know, but their problems are still going to be there the next day and probably have gotten worse, okay? Um, this is the nature of inebriation. Well, spiritually, the same thing happens. People will tend to escape from reality through inebriation. They will become intoxicated, misled by wrong spirits, and they'll go into it wholesale. Now, they're all claiming to be sons of light, but the faithful believers will be the ones who have sobriety, who are aware of what is going on and understand that these things herald the parousia, the approaching return of Jesus. That's what he's saying. It uses the Revelation 12 example, or that would come later in Revelation 12, about the woman in travail. Now, the woman in travail in Revelation 12 in our book, Harpezo, we explain it, how the man-child is caught up to heaven and so forth, and the dragon makes war with the woman and the rest of her offspring, and how this replays the nativity narrative. You can get the book should you be so inclined to read it, but understand the obstetric element is vital. Unless you understand maternal labor, Let's you understand the, the obstetric process. You're not going to understand the return of Jesus and how it's going to happen. Just think about pregnancy. 
Now, if you've had a baby or if you had a couple of babies, your wife has had a, a few kids, well, she can physically and psychologically handle the second one and the third one easier than the first one. But that first one, if you have not been through it, they have these things like Lamont's methods and I don't like the yoga ones, obviously, but there's these stretching exercises and all these things and, and coaching with the husband and the breathing and so forth and so forth. Okay, those things are effective in alleviating the intensity of labor up to a point. They do help. They do help. But what would happen if somebody was to say, I don't worry about that. I'm not concerned about the labor, I'm just concerned about the baby. <laughs> well, you have people who are drunk today. They're spiritually inebriated. And they're saying things that only somebody who was inebriated would say. One of their cliches is, you're looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. That is like saying, you're looking for labor contractions. I'm looking for the baby. <laughs> As if one dismisses the reality of the other. It's inebriated false logic that comes from a kind of inebriation. If you know what labor is and you do these things, I'm not saying that there's a miracle way to avoid labor other than a cesarean section <laughs> or things like this. There's people who do these things, epidurals and things like this, but labor is going to be labor. You have to anticipate the reality of it if you're going to have a baby. Well, it's there's no getting around it. Now there is a Caesarean section. The Greek term is kolobo. It is a surgical term for excision. There will be <coughs> in obstetric medicine, if the labor is intense and it goes on for say 24 hours, there's a concern of the impact that it'll have on the fetus and on the health of the mother they will elect to do a cesarean section. They'll go in and take the baby out. The rapture will be a colobo. It will be a divine cesarean section. You've suffered enough, I'm going in and grab the kid. You understand? That's the man-child. Think of the rapture as a cesarean section. That's what it is. These other people who are deluded and think it's not going to happen, and it doesn't concern us, and we're going to be out of here. <laughs> no. Contractions precede maternal delivery. There's no two ways about it. That kid is trying to get out. That's it? Well, let's understand it then. Be sober. The people denying these truths have had too much to drink as a spiritual metaphor, if you can follow what I'm saying. Well, let's continue. That day should not overtake us. Oh, he's coming like a thief in the night. Now, all the virgins slept, but the wise ones were ready to jump up and had oil in their lamps to keep it burning. We have tapes explaining this. Yes, he's coming like a thief in the night. Remember, as I've said 10,000 times, the night is the most common scriptural metaphor for the end of the age. It becomes spiritually very dark. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? He's coming like a thief in the night. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. The church will not be able to carry out its mission per se. Um, he's coming like a thief. In Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes in the night, doesn't he? 
Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes in the night, always the night. It's going to get very dark before Jesus comes. Morally and spiritually, it's going to become very, very dark. Now, obviously, this relates to having batteries for the flashlight, for the torch, oil for the lamp. Is the Bible just an ornament, or do you have the illumination of the Holy Spirit to see in the dark? Again, the book are paid, so we deal with this at some length. But let's look at this now, okay? That day should not overtake us like a thief. The faithful church, it's not going to be a surprise event. No, we do not know the day or the hour, but we're going to know it's getting closer, and it's going to be an anticipated event. In maternal labor, you call the paramedics, you call it, you know, an obstetrician. My wife's gone into labor and is going to ask two questions. When did the contractions begin? And the second is, has the water burst? <laughs> now, if that water has burst, you know the delivery is imminent. <laughs> okay. If the water is not yet burst, it's coming, but it's not the final sign. It can't happen at any moment. There will be a final sign, much like the bursting of the embryonic sac before a baby is born. There will be a final sign. It'll be a sign in the heavens. Remember when Jesus came the first time, the wise men knew from the sign in the heavens? Same when he comes again. Now again, on the book card page, so we address this. I'm simply constructing the background of what Paul tells the Thessalonians. Unless we understand this background from the first epistle to the Thessalonians, we're not going to have a proper, proper grasp of the second one. He speaks of the day of the Lord. Be alert, be sober, the day of the Lord. The scriptures tell us plainly, be ye not anxious for the day of the Lord. It'll be a time of darkness, not light. The day of the Lord is something bad, not something good. The day of the Lord is when God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist after the faithful church is removed. Now again, in the book Harpezo, we looked at the historical foreshadowings of it, one of which was the events of 70 AD. After the apostle James was martyred, a cousin of Jesus named Simeon becomes the senior pastor, as it were, of the church in Jerusalem. He remembers what his cousin Jesus said when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the Romans under Titus. Nobody knows why, but Josephus and Eusebius record that the Romans temporarily lifted the siege. Notice there's a temporary easing. And the believers fled. After the believers fled, as terrible as it was inside of Jerusalem before they fled, after they were out of there, that's when women began, sorry to be gross, it's the obstetric illustration again, waiting to deliver a baby so they'd have something to eat. There would be food riots over the placenta, over the afterbirth, literally. This, this, the grossest kind of cannibalism imaginable. There would be food riots over the placenta. They'd be fighting over, the, that's how desperate it became once the believers were out. Well, that is a microcosm of how terrible it's going to be <coughs> for those who are not rescued. You understand? That's how terrible it's going to be. It can't get any worse than this. Oh, don't worry. After we get you out of here, it's going to be a lot worse than this. After the rapture, it becomes, and the resurrection, it becomes much worse. Much worse. This is what Paul is writing. 
So it's the day of the Lord. And then he's urging them to put on the breastplate and get ready for war and things like this. That's what he writes to 1 Thessalonians. Let's go now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to the passage assigned me by Fellowship Bible Chapel. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> blame Steve and John and <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. This word is epi synagogue. Epi around synagogue, where we get the word synagogue. Synagogue is not a Hebrew term, it's a Greek term. The epi synagogue, our gathering around. It does not say rapture, it does not say harpezo, it says epi synagogue. What is it talking about? Well, we know in Thessalonians, in chapter 4, Paul writes to them about not being overly grieved for those who are asleep as if you have no hope. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Okay. The rapture and the resurrection are virtually simultaneous events. The dead in Christ rise first, we meet him in the air, okay? Anastasia, resurrection, anastasia, plus harpezo, plus rapture, equals episunagage, okay? Episunagage. We'll come back to this shortly, but understand what it means. It's not just the rapture. It doesn't matter. Um, if you are gonna catch a flight um, from Columbus to, to Chicago, uh, and you and your friend or your, your, your son or your wife or your brother or something like that couldn't get on the same flight as you, I'm gonna get this flight You'll get the next one. I'll meet you at O'Hare Airport. I'll meet you at Midway Airport in Chicago. I'll see you at 11 o'clock at, at, at O'Hare Airport. Okay. There may be a temporary separation, but we're going to meet up again, okay? We're going to meet up again. There may be a temporary separation. Some of us are going to go to the Episunagage by way of resurrection, but we shall not all sleep. Some of us are going to go by way of <coughs> of being snatched away by way of harpezo. That's what it's saying, okay? Now that's the background, okay? We'll see you in Chicago or LA or wherever you're going. <coughs> in this case, it's paradise. So it continues. That you are not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a messenger, or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. These people were saying the day of the Lord has come, and they were telling the church this. It caused people to think they missed the rapture. What about the dead? Did they... <laughs> The dead believers, it's created a mess. And they were trying to give some kind of apostolic stamp of approval to this false teaching. That was the situation that they were in. Now, while in 1 Thessalonians, he's emphasizing the need for being alert and being sober, he also says in 2 Thessalonians, do not lose composure. A big problem concerning the return of Jesus is something we've addressed in the teaching, the caveats of the Olivet Discourse, rambunction. The end is not yet. Let's go back to the expectant young mother. The baby begins to kick around and move. She goes into early labor. Don't freak out. 
We'll phone the obstetrician. We'll drive to the hospital. Maybe we'll get an ambulance. But don't freak out. Keep your composure. Everything is under control. The water has not burst. Okay? The embryonic sac is still intact. Yeah, the baby's coming, but don't lose your composure. Composure. The worst thing you can do in an emergency is to lose your composure, isn't it? Can you imagine a, a surgeon with someone's life, biological life in, 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 the, in the surgeon's hands, and the patient begins to go south on the operating table, and the anesthesiologist and the surgeon has to revive the person? What would you think of a surgeon? What are you going to do? Stop breathing. What are you, <laughs> you don't want someone like that. You want someone who has composure, who's in control, who can think rationally under pressure and make the right decisions and do the right thing. Well, it's like any other emergency. You know, you, when they train people for the fire department or things like this, you don't want people who freak out. You don't want people who can't keep it together under extreme pressure. Don't lose your composure, he's saying. Again, on the teaching of the caveats of the Alamut Discourse, we warn about rambunction. These things must happen, but the end is not yet. Yes, there's contractions, but the embryonic sac has not burst. Let's continue. This also relates to John 16, but we won't go there now for the sake of brevity. <coughs> Let no one in any way deceive you. We have people today who are radical preterists, who do not teach that the events of 70 AD partially fulfill the warnings of Jesus and will be recapitulated at the end of the age. To say that what happened in 70 AD that we just described is a type, a picture of the rapture and teaches about it and what's going to happen. There was a partial fulfillment in 70 AD. That's completely correct. Okay, that was completely correct. But you have people today who are very dangerously teaching that the Great Tribulation was in 70 AD, that the Antichrist was one of the Roman emperors, okay, he's often Nero, that don't worry about any future meaning, meaning to these prophetic scriptures about the return of Christ. These are radical preterists. It already happened, don't worry about it. Right from the beginning, we are warned about this kind of preterism. There are people who believe this. This is the cornerstone of Calvinistic Reconstructionism. The theology of Calvinistic Reconstructionist Calvinists, the onimus, is this. People like the late Rousses Rushduni and uh, David Shilton and Gary North, they propagated this among Calvinists. The other is the hyper-charismatic cousins, uh, people caught up in dominion theology, kingdom now, over-realized eschatology. Now, over-realized eschatology has mutated, or I should say masqueraded in different forms. It permeated the vineyard movement of, of John Wimber, of the Kansas City false prophets. Now it is in the new apostolic reformation. It may mutate in its form. It was around in the 1940s and 1950s with the Manifest Sons teaching, the man-child teaching, uh, that was associated with people who followed William Branham and things like this. It's, it changes costumes, but it's the same core error, okay? The same core error that these things have already happened in the early church, don't worry about the future, something like that. Don't believe it. There's a teaching we have called the Twin Pillars and Badness, where we show hyper-Calvinists 
and hypercharismatics, they have very similar eschatologies. And many of their other doctrines are similar. Many. Like the Dominion theology, we're going to conquer the world before Christ comes and set up his kingdom. Well, that was the thinking of some of the Puritans. That was the thinking <laughs> of, of, of the Calvinists, that we're going to bring in the scripture as God's law on earth to prepare the way for the return of Christ. They, they do the same things. And they have the same wrong views of Jesus coming. Now, this is something to be aware of. Anything to do with reconstructionism, theonomy, anything to do with that brand of Calvinism, or anything to do with hyper-charismatic dominionism, kingdom now theology, triumphalism, be careful of that stuff. Don't just be careful of it. Avoid it like the plague. We are warned from the beginning. Look out for it. Those who propagate such things, we are told, are deceivers in verse 3. The people who propagate these things are deceivers. Oh, he's a good brother. No, he's a deceiver. Satan always comes as an angel of light. Oh, he's a nice guy, and I met him. I don't always agree with him, but he's just... He's deceived, and he's deceiving others. Remember in Timothy, they will come deceiving and being deceived? Is Benny Hinn cognizantly a deceiver? Yes, the man knows he's a deceiver. I'm convinced. I met him once in Hawaii. I confronted him. I believe the man knows he's a deceiver, but I also believe he's deceived. The Kansas City false prophets. They were deceivers? Yes, they're deceivers, but they're also deceived. They believe the lie themselves. The most dangerous liars are the ones who believe it themselves. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The day of the Lord will not come until there is an apostasy and the Antichrist, the Anthroponenomon, is revealed. Now understand enomon or enomos. Nomos is law. There are do's and don'ts in the New Testament the same as there are in the Old Testament. If you drive across the border from Canada into the USA or from the USA into Canada, you can't say I'm no longer under the law. No, you may no longer be under Canadian law or no longer under American law, but you're under a different body of law. First Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says this. I'm no longer under the law of Moses. I'm under the law of Christ. There are do's and don'ts in the New Testament the same as there are in the Old. Be careful of people who yell legalism and freedom in Christ, which is essentially licentiousness. Today, this lie being propagated is called hyper grace. Much of it has come from Joseph Prince in Singapore, who's a colleague of Joel Austin and these people. The hyper-grace teaching is simply licentiousness. It is simply licentiousness. The grace of God, we are told, is there to bring us to repentance. Lord, I did this, I dropped my cross, I messed this up, and you want to forgive me anyway? <laughs> it's to bring conviction and repentance and restoration. It is not a license to continue in an ungodly way. Be careful of the hyper-grace teaching. It is around today, and it has gained tremendous popularity through people like Joel Austin and things like this. That's not the grace of God. 
It's a complete perversion. It is licentiousness. Now understand, it's setting the stage for Antichrist. He will be the man of lawlessness. He will be the man of lawlessness. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Ikrete in Greek, I've said this so many times, you're probably tired of me saying it. We're told it twice in the New Testament, ikrete, self-control. I'm not a cessationist. The doctrine that the gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts, cease with the apostles is not scriptural. I'm not a cessationist. But most of what you see today being called charismata is not real. Most of the prophecy is clairvoyance. Most of the tongues, probably gibberish. Now, I'm not denying what's real, <laughs> but most of what we see popularly is not authentic. Self-control. When you see someone in hysterics behaving like a levity-controlled drunkard in Toronto or Lakeland or Pensacola and they're kicking around and all these things and some of them even with sexual gyrations and things like this. I've seen films of this and I saw it in a meeting when they were doing it. We're free! Wait a minute, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Um, God's not in control of you unless you're in control of yourself. If an alcoholic gets saved and begins hitting the jug again, is, is God in control of him? No. Why? Because he or she are no longer in control of themselves. Uh, oh, you're a legalist! The letter kill it, the spirit give it life! Oh my God, they, they don't even know what that means. They don't even know what it means. The letter kill it, the spirit give it life. They think it means the letter of the spirit to do this and that. We don't need the, the, the letter kill it. This is complete idiocy. It's not just demonic deception, it's idiocy. The law of Moses, through the example of Israel and the Jews, shows we're condemned because of our sin. It's being born of the spirit that giveth life. It shows us we need salvation through Christ who kept the law of God perfectly. One man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin, so he can save all of us, as we'll look at tomorrow. This is what it means. The Sanhedrin, particularly the Pharisees, were interpreting the letter of the law in a legalistic way. They were into the Bill Clinton thing. I did not have sex with that woman. Depends on what the meaning of is is. Bill Clinton would have fit right into the Sanhedrin if he was a Jew in the first century. They would have loved him. That kind of legalistic argumentation. The letter of the law says thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. You desire someone's wife or someone's husband. You even desire to sleep with them. As far as God's concerned, you did sleep with them. <laughs> Jesus interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. He didn't play legalistic games with the letters to get a guilty client off. <laughs> well, that's what it means. But these people, in their deluded ignorance, don't know that's what it means. <laughs> this sets the stage for Antichrist. Freedom without parameters will lead to slavery. Liberty without responsibility is a time bomb. This unrestricted freedom as they see it, it has a built-in death mechanism. It is a freedom that will only lead to bondage and slavery. I see this so often. 
You see in these churches that are into casting demons out of believers, instead of taking personal responsibility for their lives and asking God for the grace to carry their cross, they think of just get the demons cast out. Oh, I've got a spirit of nicotine. I had somebody tell me that once because they wanted a cigarette. I've got a spirit of lust. I've got a, I wanted to go to the gambling shop. I have a spirit, you know, of, 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 of covetousness. I wanted to I'll get it cast out. Who's getting the demons cast out this week? The same ones that got it cast out last week. Does their life change? No. No. Freedom divorced from responsibility is a false liberty that inevitably leads to bondage. To bondage. The people that are caught up in this deliverance stuff, they're in bondage. They're in bondage. They actually begin confessing that they're demonized. When you, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you can get saved that way. You're handing a demon the keys to the door. They're putting themselves into psychological and spiritual bondage. Jesus came to set you free, but you're going into bondage in the name of freedom. Now, you can look at this sociologically. Look, look at cities like Amsterdam and San Francisco. Look what's become of San, arguably the most beautiful city in the United States. Look what's, it's a public sewer. Look what's become of Frisco. The, the, the people from New York call San Francisco Frisco. L look at it. How did that happen? Freedom without responsibility is going to lead to bondage. It's going to happen. Scandinavia is like this. But you know, so are many churches. And so are the lives of many Christians. What they don't understand is there is an antichrist spirit driving this. Now, the plain meaning is obvious. I read an article recently by a guy who I had been talking to, and he is a fairly good Greek scholar in the academic sense. His Greek is really good. His Greek is impressive. He's seminary-level Greek, at least. <laughs> and you won't believe what he does for a living the most the, the, the wild anomaly I think I've ever seen in the church. This guy is seriously, seriously exegetically gifted in terms of Greek. He can parse sentences in Greek. Uh, well, I guess I, I, maybe I can do that too, but he, he, he concentrates on it. He's really good. And for a living, he's a professional comedian. <laughs> he's a stand-up comedian. Lives in Pennsylvania. Maybe that explains it. <laughs> the guy's a comedian for a living. But what he writes, his papers, I'm dialoguing with him about the genealogies. He's working on something in the genealogies from the Greek text, and I've been talking to him and things a bit. <clears throat> His name is Seth Nor. Seth Nor. He's, he's a Christian comedian. And he wrote an absolutely terrific article, the best thing I've read on refuting the new fangled pre tribulationism. The newfangled pre-tribulationism states that the apostasy is not a falling away or a rebellion. It is the rapture itself. It means a spatial departure. Forget about the fact that everywhere in the Septuagint or anywhere else where the term is used, it means a rebellion. 
1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it tells us there'll be a rebellion before the Lord comes. The last days are going to be heralded by this rebellion. The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter days, some will fall away, apostatize. These people, led by Thomas Ice, who I know, and Wayne House, <coughs> people who should know better, say based on an underlying word, epistemi, they are treating a verb, I'm sorry, a noun as a verb. They're treating a noun as a verb. In other words, the define, they are defining apostasia by its verbal cognate. Now, I said the same thing, but he expressed it much better. He expressed it much better than I did. I said it, and some other people said it, but he expressed it much better. The lengths they've gone to, misquoting, earlier manuscripts, not in Greek, but in the Latin Vulgate, where the word is decisio. They tried to say it means a spatial departure. <coughs> no, it does not. This is a semantic anachronism. How can the rapture <laughs> come before the rapture. <laughs> a noun is a noun, and a verb is a verb. I had some guy last week, somebody pointed it out to me, I don't pay attention to him, but he said, Jacob Prash teaches error. He says in the conversion of Paul, that Paul fell forward at the end. He uses the word, Pros, in Acts 1, 6, but the word is pipto. The account begins in Acts 1, 6. Keep reading verse 7, 8, and 9. Pros, he fell forward. <laughs> the guy didn't know the difference between a preposition <laughs> and the participle of a verb. He did not know the difference between a preposition and the participle of a verb. It's what Proverbs says, answering a fool in his folly, according to his folly. Oh, unbelievable. It's un There's nothing worse than somebody who pretends to have an expertise in Greek or Hebrew who doesn't. James White is another one. James White is another one. I said, this is not doctoral level Greek. Then I find out both of his doctorates or from a non-accredited institution. It's, it's a double-barrel phony. <laughs> this is not doctor-level Greek. Dr. James, what is it? Yeah! You know what happens if somebody pretends to be a physician? <laughs> and, and hangs out a shingle and practice? They get arrested for practicing medicine without a license. If the world has the sense to get rid of a phony doctor, shouldn't the church? One can kill people physically, the other can kill people spiritually. This is not doctoral level Greek. No wonder both your doctors aren't even real. Again, Pennsylvania. You want to be an astronaut or a brain surgeon? Send the matchbook cover away with two dollars and fifty cents. The cent <laughs> little kid with a cereal box to be a junior astronaut. So he mails the box top of his cereals in it to General Mills, and he gets a little certificate that he's a junior astronaut. But then he goes down to Houston, to the Manned Spacecraft Center, or to Cape Canaveral in Florida, and he meets real astronauts who begin talking shop. 
<laughs> the little kid doesn't know anything about aeronautics. <laughs> it's unbelievable that the church tolerates these phony academic credentials. You must have an inferiority complex that you feel you need this credential, so, but you don't have it, so you go buy one or whatever you do, or get it from a non-accredited institution. This is, this is pathetic. But these are the kinds of people who were misleading the church in Thessalonians. They were frauds. They were frauds then, and they are frauds now. A noun is a noun, and a verb is a verb. Because the cognate, apostemite, can mean a spatial departure. You can't say that. It's like saying, butterfly come from butter. <laughs> now butterflies come from caterpillars. They go into a cocoon. No, the underlying word is butter. This stuff is nuts. And traditional pre-trib people know it's nuts. A person I respect who is pre-trib and who I have a high regard for is a Christian lawyer and theologian, Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He successfully debated, more slaughtered Hank Hanegraaff in a debate. And Mark Hitchcock, again himself, prominent pre-trib theologian, our pre-trip theologian said, if that was the case, it wouldn't say apostasia, it would say harpezo. <laughs> These people are not even traditional pre-trib. The traditional pre-trib was the Larry Norman song when I was first saved as a hippie, as a young believer. I wish we'd all been ready. You know, did that thing, I wish we'd all been ready. Now they're saying other things. No, the rapture's gonna herald a great end time revival. Huh? The scripture tells us in Revelation, once the faithful church is removed, men still did not depart from their wicked deeds. They only got worse. It's all fabrication. Well, never in the Septuagint, never in Josephus, never anywhere do you have the use of the term apostasy, meaning anything other than a departure from the truth, a rebellion, the Cesio in the Vulgate. <coughs> Not only that, so they've got a problem because it says the apostasy, so they have to redefine the apostasy. They've got to turn, they've got to turn a noun into a verb based on an underlying cognate. But then they've got another problem. Well, The other way we can get around it is say that the rapture can happen any time before the final seven years. So some of these people have postulated that the rapture takes place up to 41 years before the final seven years. <laughs> I'm serious. They're losing their mind. They're losing their mind. No, I don't agree with pre-trip, I never did, but they're losing their mind. <laughs>